what I'm not, we'll be talking about today is really um, the result of a long ongoing research interest in what I would call um, yeah, the, the hidden integration of Europe. It is part of a network of historians of technology that was founded in uh, 1999 already. Uh, so for more than 15 years now, we more than 200 historians of technology from all over Europe, but also including American colleagues, have been thinking about of what, what is the role of technology in the shaping of, of modern Europe. Uh, and um, so the result of these uh, uh, networks and the, 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 the research we have been doing are at the moment published in a, in a new book series uh, called The Making of Europe. It's a five, uh, pardon, a six volume uh, series uh, which offers, I think, a, a kind of alternative look at European history uh, in the 19th and 20th century. And I'm very happy and glad that I can co-author uh, the final volume of this uh, series with my colleague Pascal Griset from uh, Sorbonne University on communication technologies, uh, information technologies, and uh, yeah, their role in the construction of the European uh, space. So what I will be talking about today is related to that research and to the, to the network. And on the other side, it is part of a kind of newer interest I have since I moved to the University of Luxembourg three years ago. Uh, and for me, it was quite natural uh, doing research on radio uh, that I would be looking at Radio Luxembourg uh, more closely. I did so before, but now also with students, I engaged in, in a kind of research activity, organized a research seminar. Uh, over uh, three semesters, and the result of that uh, project is now uh, presented at uh, our blog from the European uh, Master History Master Program. Uh, it's a kind of virtual exhibition which tries to yeah, offer new narratives, new on the history of Radio Luxembourg, combining different forms of storytelling, biographies, story maps. Uh, we developed a time timeline including audiovisual sources and so on. I think it's a very fine example of what we're trying to do uh, in our master's program uh, with our students that is studying history, yes, but also with new forms of uh, tools, digital tools, and thinking about new ways of presenting uh, the history online. So today I will uh, give you uh, uh, an, an overview on uh, the emergence of what I call a new regulatory regime in radio broadcasting in the interwar uh, years. And the hypothesis is that this new regime can be uh, understood as an example of what uh, my colleagues uh, Johann Schott from uh, Eindhoven and um, uh, uh, um, others in the network have called technocratic internationalism. So you see in the interwar years a lot of activities in the field of science and technology developing forms of collaboration, transnational collaboration, which to a certain degree become a model for what's happening after the Second World War when we generally think that Euro the European integration process uh, started. So our hypothesis is that this started much earlier in the 19th century, uh, mid-19th century and uh, interwar years, especially in the field of science and technology, and that this can be seen as a yeah, role model for what happened later in the, for example, sectorial integration within the European integration process. And I will more specifically look at the role that technical experts in the field of radio broadcasting uh, played in uh, the shaping of this, uh, this regime and think about what, you know, what is the kind of specific expertise that these people needed in order to make this regime uh, working. And therefore I use the term of techno-diplomacy, which for me fits best to describe this very yeah, specific kind of expertise 
that developed during those uh, years. It's a kind of m mingling of yeah, technical expertise, but also acting more or less as a diplomat in an international arena, uh, and at the same time uh, having uh, economic interests uh, continuously interfered in, in their work. Uh, and the term of yeah, techno-diplomacy really tries to catch this uh, specific form of expertise. So I, I prepared also a script for my lecture. I, I didn't know what kind of public I would expect or could expect, so I, I had like 150 students in mind <laughs> and, and prepared like a classical uh, a lecture. Um, but I will try to be as interactive as possible and please interrupt me uh, uh, whenever you have a question uh, uh, concerning uh, what I will be talking about. So, what we hear from the loudspeaker, wrote the German-born radio critic uh, and media theorist Rudolf Arnheim in 1936, <coughs> is an artistically forceful symbol of constant war in peace, of the deficiency of central authority which we permit around us a chaos concretized in discord and as such directly perceptible to the human ear. So the dance music of one country comes through the funeral march of another. In a similar fashion, Arno Hu, author of the impressive survey of international broadcast activities uh, entitled La Radiodiffusion, Puissance Mondiale, argued in 1937 I quote, before the international cooperation there was chaos. Each country allotted frequencies following their national needs and without taking care of the transnational nature of broadcasting. As a result, radio reception became a martyrdom and the listener suffered from constant interferences and turned into a victim of the peeping, cracking, crunching and groaning sounds of which he contains a horrified memory." End of the quote. The notion of chaos became uh, really the broadcast expert's most frequently used metaphor to describe the problem of interwar uh, interferences in radio transmissions. Very soon, radio amateur clubs, broadcasting institutions and administrative bodies called for the establishment of an ether police able to regulate and control the rapidly growing uh, radio activities. But as uh, Caesar um, Searchinger diagnosed, Caesar Searchinger was a CBS uh, correspondent in, in Europe in his book Hello America Radio Adventures in Europe from 1938, I quote, when European Europeans, armed with state sovereignty and loaded with national pride, come together for a similar purpose, imagine their difficulties when asking to relinquish a wavelength or to reduce the power of a station for the benefit of a foreigner and a potential enemy. Yes. Was there deliberate jamming in the interwar period, or that only starting before the war? That is only starting in uh, the war, in 1940. Uh, mm -hmm. Only starting with the Second World War. Okay. So, no, that was <coughs> unintended uh, uh, interferences until really uh, okay. the, the use of it as uh, as a political or military uh, means in the war. That Europeans finally managed to more or less successfully regulate their crowded radio spectrum was for searching a fully to the credit of the International Broadcasting Union. Uh, and its technical center, which was located in Brussels. For him, the technical center was, I quote, the nerve center of European broadcasting, the greenage of the air. The work of the IBU technical center can indeed be interpreted <coughs> as a striking example of this concept of techno diplomacy that I mentioned earlier characterized by shifting regi regimes of regulation and readjusted politics of control. It could be told as a transnational success story, or 
as a sequence of dashed hopes and sudden setbacks. Yet the most appropriate way or narrative structure, I think, for this story would be that of a soap opera. The international conferences that were allocating broadcasting frequencies, um, they were no negotiated on and on and always ended with a cliffhanger and a closing frame like to be continued. So identification with the central characters of the story, another crucial property of a soap opera, was or is relatively easy too, as the main performers of these highly ritualized venues showed a surprising continuity. A lurid but apt title for this uh, affair would then the drama of European frequency disorder. The first European initiative to face really this problem was taken by a Swiss radio amateur, Maurice Rambert. In October 1922, Rambert had obtained the first license for radio broadcasting in Switzerland. A first class radio amateur, Rambert suffered from, this, uh, from this increased disorder and uh, within a year already he initiated a first European meeting of broadcasters in Geneva together with his friend uh, Raymond, or, pardon, Edmond Privat who was the president of the Bureau International de l'Esperanto. So this first conference organized uh, in April 1924 assembled some 40 representatives of uh, state administrations, private uh, associations, radio clubs, and uh, also some members of the radio industry. The gathering resulted in a number of resolutions, including um, to reserve an exclusive part of the frequency spectrum for radio broadcasting and for radio amateurs as well as the formation of a permanent organization uh, for broadcasting regulation in Geneva. Robert, elected chairman of the Provisional Executive Committee, was charged with preparing a second meeting at the British Broadcasting Company, which was, had just been uh, established in Great Britain. Um, so this meeting in uh, March 1925 so this is the original document, the minutes of this first meeting in uh, London 1925, which are at the uh, written archives of the BBC in Caversham, um, resumes the, the, the opening uh, debates and the, uh, the uh, emergence of this really uh, association. In April 1925, the Union Internationale de Radiophonie was finally officially inaugurated. The BBC Deputy Managing Director uh, Charles Carpendale became President and his colleague Arthur Bowers, uh, Chief Engineer of the BBC, uh, served as the firm, first permanent director of the IBU in Geneva. From the start, Geneva presented the ideal headquarters location because of its reputation as a host city of numerous international organizations, most prominently the League of Nations, the Organisation Internationale de Travail, uh, the Bureau International de l'Esperanto, and the Committee of the Red Cross, and of course the Permanent Secretariat of the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, uh, which was, in a way, the first non-governmental uh, association, international association, ever founded in 1865. So placing the Union Internationale de Radiophonie in Geneva was a highly symbolic act. The founders signed its charter at the offices of the League of Nations, a, cer a ceremonial performance, affirming a vision to use broadcasting as a means for peaceful purposes. All members joining the UER, as diverse as their intentions and interests may have been, were convinced of the exceptional importance of radio broadcasting as a political and cultural instrument. 
And despite the alarming tendencies demonstrating national or even nationalistic instrumentalizations of the medium for ideological or political purposes, the IBU Central's actor promoted a humanist ideology, seeing in radio broadcasting a means of international understanding and the transcendence of economic classes, political ideologies and territorial boundaries. So exactly one year after the founding of the IBU, all members signed a so-called gentleman's agreement banning illegal and immoral use of radio for propaganda. In the following years, several bilateral and international conventions promoting the so-called moral disarmament of the either were signed. So this close link between the technical and the political dimension in missions to harmonize European broadcasting is arresting. It underlines the fruitfulness of conceptualizing and analyzing infrastructures as a conglomerate of an interplay between material, institutional, and symbolic factors. A look at the development of the IBU's organizational structure, I think, reinforces this view. After the creation of a technical committee in December 25, permanent, uh, a permanent juridical committee started work in March 26, followed only three months later by a committee of intellectual, artistic and social rapprochement, and then finally by a committee of international relays in 1928. So this institutional or organizational structure perfectly mirrors, I think, the intertwining of political, technical, juridical, artistic, and even intellectual questions uh, that the actors saw as needing mediation. The first and most effective way of harmonizing the European either was to agree on allocating specific frequencies to specific broadcast stations. So three months after its inauguration, the IBU convened the Conference of Radio Engineers in Geneva, attended by 13 broadcasting institutions and representing some 50 radio stations. A survey of those transmit transmitting on a frequency band between 217, uh, sorry, 270 and 550 meters listed some 87 European stations and another 40 to plan uh, to start uh, shortly. So as the de designation of frequency bands to specific radio services, mm -hmm. that is, for example, broadcasting, amateur radio, uh, military use, marine communication, uh, remained within the authority of the International Telegraph Union, ITU, the IBU's task was to allot specific wavelengths to uh, specific radio services in the different countries. This with the aim to maximize yeah, the order uh, and to avoid that any station just broadcasts on a frequency of its choice uh, and on a power of its choice. But as Peter Eckersley, BBC chief engineer, recalled in his autobiography, the union's future was foreshadowed by already at the, already the first meeting. It became, to quote Eckersley, a history of a struggle between realist technicians and those who had legal principles. What happened was, a tick, I think, a typical example of the impossibility of getting international conferences to agree to anything, however desirable, for the common welfare. This was still the quote of Eckersley. While some delegates were good technicians but could not understand French, others who spoke French had problems in understanding the technicalities. Though Eckersley mem Eckersley's memoirs must be used with some caution, as they are written in a slightly ironic, sometimes even sarcastic undertone, they nevertheless offer a rare glimpse of the practical challenges of international experts 
negotiating a frequency plan. At such venues, delegates with very different professional and cultural backgrounds met in a climate clearly promoting international understanding, but susceptible to national sensitivities of all kinds. To quote again Eckersley, I soon came to realize that je suis tout à fait d'accord, mais, meant, je ne suis pas d'accord, mais being the operative word. En principe, meant, I understand what you mean, but I don't agree, but, but I don't agree. So in addition to this problem of differing languages, of cultural diplomacy, national interests constantly interfered with finding an international compromise. When Eckersley began urging acceptance for a provisional plan during the last Geneva meeting in July uh, 1926 with the words, quote, let us think, sink then any national interest for the sake of international agreement, an Italian delegate interrupted him, pointing to the specific needs of his country. Please, Mr. President, my country is a very long country with many big mountains, and our wavelength is, please, is a very, very short wavelength. And please, yes, yes, I replied, I quite understand, but perhaps this rather particular national question could be settled or discussed later. I know, I now want to plan, sorry, I now want the plan to be considered in its international aspect. As I was saying, the little man sat back, looking very miserable. After another ten minutes of my oratory, up went the hand again. Please, my country is a very long country, he will. My country is a very long country became in uh, the following years the slogan to typify those delegates who never came to a conference without uh, uh, the desire to come out, to come out with more than uh, went in. So Eckersley, as I said, account is, is highly subjective, of course, uh, but it gives a lively impression of the atmosphere in which the first uh, frequency plan was negotiated. Yes? Did they radiotape it back then or so? Are there any, any, any tapes of these discussions? No. No. no we only have the minutes of, uh, of the have? meeting that I showed from the... And there you can really find this kind of... Uh, 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 literal description of, of these uh, discussions, yeah? Um, okay, you use the word international. It, it at the same time, it sounds like you're talking uh, about the, the medium wave broadcast mm -hmm. band as opposed to the short wave band, right. whereas you know, the really international stuff, which is all over the world, is going to be affected by the short wave band mm -hmm. more than the medium wave band. Right. So I'm, I'm wondering, is, is, was there any consideration of the short wave bands yeah. at that point, or is it just going to be... I'll come to that okay. in a minute. So this first plan was really only about medium waves, but of course, as the technology developed, um, this short wave issue became a, a central issue in the debates, and that's why uh, this to be continued became uh, uh, really the, the model of these conferences. Once they had agreed on a plan, technology had moved, moved further and they needed to re-design uh, um, uh, the plan. So this is why it was a kind of soap opera uh, 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 initiative. Um, so, as no provisional plan emerged from uh, Geneva, a smaller group of radio technicians, chaired by the French uh, radio engineer Raymond Braillard, here in the middle, met in uh, September and December 25 to devise what they called a number of neutral parameters. This framework allocated each European country at least one exclusive frequency and several shared frequencies, so proportionally, depending on the number of existing stations, the topography and size of a country, and its economic or cultural development. Thereby, every country's share of the spectrum could be calculated. Braillard's vision of the plan was submitted to the Council in March 26 and was officially adopted by the IBU members in November 26. According to Ackersley, the BBC chief engineer, this success reflected Braillard's, to quote, quick understanding of technical problems, 
his flair for the political implications underlying technical pro proposals, and above all, for his ability to translate technical facts into the language of juridical compromise. End of quote. His formula represented a kind of logical and depoliticized tool to the jurists who had resisted technical arguments. Although far from being an objective tool, um, it, uh, a great majority of the delegations um, accepted it because of its apparently logical basis. Yet, the result of this cal calculation depended on who was to be included in Europe as a broadcasting region and who not. Geneva Plan Europe lacked the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. Spain, Hungary, Turkey or Finland. So when the Soviet Union got involved in, re in, the re in revised frequency planning uh, during the Prague conference in 1929, the Geneva Plan Europe changed radically. The first frequency plan should therefore be interpreted as an attempt to combine the rational positions of radio engineers with political agendas of the national telecommunication authorities and broadcasting organizations. Braillard, so he was the head of the technical center of the IBU in, uh, in Brussels, um, was nevertheless convinced that um, this way of approaching could finally uh, lead to uh, um, a regulation, a regulatory regime, which would which, which was, uh, solve the uh, problem of interferences. In his view, the plan defected, uh, depended sorry, on two factors. First, on the quality of construction and stability of the transmitters. Second, on the possibility of calibrating the transmitters with a precise frequency meter. I will come to this later. Well, the first factor was clearly beyond, IBU control, beyond the IBU's control. The technical committee f uh, agreed on developing a cheap and robust frequency meter suitable both for professionals and amateurs. So, one could say that the main technical remedy for the chaotic situation in the European ether was to be found in an accurate control of a broadcast station's transmitter. This could be achieved by this newly designed frequency meter calibrated to the frequency allotted to this station by the Geneva plan or later the Prime plan. So, institutionalizing the IBU as an ether police involved creating uh, a permanent IBU technical center uh, in Gervise, which is near to uh, Brussels, uh, which became really um, the headquarter of uh, or the nerve center and techno-scientific conscience of the IBU. Led by Raymond Braillard, a relatively small team of technical and accounting staff handled the daily frequency measurements and prepared monthly reports uh, presenting appropriate figures, facts and maps. In addition, the laboratory's force working year focused on constructing these frequency meters and to uh, selling them to the different broadcasting uh, institutions. Um, so. I can show you a figure of yeah, these frequency measurements that they did on a daily basis. So here you see that stations like Copenhagen, Naples, uh, Paris, Barcelona, Prague, yeah, they, couldn't, they had a hard time really controlling the stability of the frequency in, in, in their transmissions. And all of this, of course, caused these interferences uh, in the densely populated frequency spectrum and to uh, uh, work on, on the stability of these uh, uh, transmissions was therefore seen as the main remedy uh, for the chaos. Let me 
interrupt here with a short um, excursus on effects of this regulatory practice and the calibration of, of stations on the design of radio receivers. Before uh, this calibration happened, before the, uh, uh, the, the standardization, so to speak, of the plan happened, uh, radio receivers had no radio dial. Sense. You had to do this uh, on your own, and you need to have a certain technical skill in order to uh, 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 so tune in into different frequencies. And there was no list of, of stations uh, available with specific uh, frequencies because they changed all of the time. Now, with this being standardized, also the radio industry was able to produce sets that offered various designs for users uh, that could then very easily switch from one station uh, to another. So this uh, signpost in the frequency jungle uh, is also from a design perspective and a user perspective really crucial in uh, turning radio from an amateur medium into a real mass medium. Without this design offering a very easy ac access to, to radio uh, as broadcasting, uh, I think it would never have developed into a real mass medium. Now you could, as here, just in a telephone uh, design, dial uh, a specific station. You could push the button uh, of specific stations and therefore the sets were promoted as yeah, the, the robots of, of broadcasting or the thinking uh, receiver and there were really lots of fan fantastic new designs that were developed here this one the England Geographic from Austria even had a like, little lamp when you uh, put uh, a specific station on the, <laughs> on the map so all of this I think it's really uh, crucial if one wants to understand also how radio broadcasting emerged as a mass medium in the European uh, context. But this is another topic that I can't focus on at, in this lecture. Uh, but I published a, uh, a, an article on, on the emergence of the radio dial as a mediating interface uh, for the yeah, ether voyages in the European uh, landscape. In, in the Oxford Handbook of, of uh, Sound Studies, so if you're interested, you can have a look at that there. Um, let's turn back. So we have um, uh, had the, the, the first Geneva uh, plan, um, but yeah, almost within a year it became clear that this first regulatory initiative uh, could only partly cure the chaotic situation in the spectrum. Um, this was partly because the Geneva plan only yeah, regulated medium waves while ignoring long waves that also uh, were quite popular at the time. The other and for the technical committee more problematic uh, uh, thing was that even IBU members often ignored their Geneva agreements or failed to apply them in accurate way. So this tension between a de jure regulation and a de facto violation demonstrates the IBU's critical status as a regulator. As a non-governmental organization, it had no real political or juridical power to demand compliance, let alone to exert pressure on non-member operators. And this will be crucial when I speak about Radio Luxembourg which was a non-member. As a frustrated Raymond Braillard uh, noted, um, I quote, the technical committee does its best to heal the situation, but we can only act in the limits of our possibilities and call upon the goodwill of our members. We try to convince by the power of technical arguments, which often reveals successful. But what can a doctor do if the patient refuses to take the remedy? that has been prescribed. Isn't it a fact that a few troublemakers 
can rain on someone's parade, and they all of people lament most strongly of being troubled. And of course, I have, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, but coming back to the, the conference where we negotiated, and now I'm speaking about the members, uh, who own these frequencies? Were these the governments? Were these private companies, uh, broadcasters? Because you kind of, you know, you spoke about. Uh, private broadcasting and, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. amateur broadcasting. So uh, was this an intergovernmental conference uh, or was it, you know, mixed conference? Or how, how were the delegates legitimate yeah. to, to... No, to, it, uh, it started as a private initiative by, by Rambert in, in Switzerland and he invited um, private uh, commercial stations as well as um, uh, um, public services like uh, the BBC uh, the radio industry, so it started as a very yeah, diverse group of, of actors, but as uh, radio broadcasting in general in Europe in the 19, especially 1930s, became more and more uh, uh, controlled by the state mm -hmm. and turned into a kind of state monopoly mm -hmm. in most European countries, mm -hmm. there we see a shift from the members uh, less and less private actors because you have less and less private stations and more and more uh, central state authorities like PTT authorities uh, and so on. So you had, you had the governments appropriated those yes. frequencies and then they gave licenses or whatever to private exactly. operators to, to yeah. operate. And this will become important when we talk about Radio Luxembourg because they more and more turned into a club defending the, uh, let's say, I. Uh, the model of radio broadcasting as being the public service model. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the US, of course, we know we have a completely different uh, a model. And so private actors within the European landscape had a, a more and more difficult uh, uh, position in order to defend, defend their uh, interests in, in this context. Yeah. Maybe I'm jumping the gun again. <laughs> did, did they assign, uh, like, bands of adjacent frequencies for a given country or do they just have the different countries intermixed all together in, in their frequencies? Um, what, what they tried to do was to give every country at least one what they called uh, um, uh, one um, unique frequency. So every country had one frequency that could only be used by this country. But in addition to that they uh, allotted several other frequencies, depending on the size uh, of the country, that could be used uh, in parallel. So, uh, for example, Great Britain got a, a frequency uh, to share on 550 meters, and this was also used then in, in Russia. So the idea was that if you have enough of a geographical distance between the stations, then the, the chance or the risk of interference will be lower. And that's how they try to, to map it really into kind of geography of, of transmission range uh, and uh, had like double or, or even triple allocations. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. As an example, um, yeah, I just quoted Baya, who was yeah, unsatisfied that um, he, as a doctor, uh, couldn't uh, help much to uh, remedy the, the problem. Um, he mentioned the case of a Spanish radio station Sevilla, which constantly transmitted on a wavelength deviating 12 kilohertz from their proper frequency, thereby strongly interfering with the Czechoslovakian station of Braun. Another challenge was the strong fluctuation of some stations, um, often uh, up to 6 kilohertz in 30 minutes. So regular frequency measurements of the technical center showed um, not only that big stations um, increasing power caused wide of interferences, but also that very low power stations transmitting with poor frequency stability had very harmful effects. So even very small uh, stations which had only a 5 uh, kilowatt uh, power uh, transmitter could cause interferences with a very strong uh, transmitter 
uh, of, I don't know, Radio Paris or the BBC. One positive uh, development was the increasing adjustment of distant transmission characteristics through telegraph and telephone communication. From 1926 on, this very practical and effective form of what Braillard called réglage à distance between the technical center and broadcasters preoccupied the technical staff in Brussels, underlining the IBU's uh, regulatory authority. The technical advance in and the accuracy of its frequency measurements helped to establish a regime of, yeah, let's call it soft regulation, based on the center's expertise and assumed political neutrality. As Eckersley remembers, I quote again from his autobiography, if the elimination of a holy noise in a million receivers demanded no more than giving X a bottle of champagne and an explanation of wave propagation and the heterodyne theory, it was better than assembling a hundred careful officials to explain to one another why they could not agree about anything. Our way of keeping the plan going was to ring up a friend on the international telephone and say, hey, I say, you, uh, I say shift your A station a kilocycle up, will you? We're getting a lot of sideband splash on our B station. The jurists wanted us to send stilted letters through, the, through those proper channels which lead along dreary corridors to an unknown burial in a dusty fire. So here again you see the tension between a man like Ackersley, an engineer, and um, yeah, the jurists who want to, to regulate it through official uh, communication channels. So this was clearly the credo of a man like Braillard, who believed that the constant progress in science would finally help to surmount transitory difficulties, provided that strict technical application would uh, uh, accompany new knowledge. While such a belief uh, reigned in many interwar uh, technocratic ne networks, it was constantly challenged by irrational political or ideological interferences, which obviously clashed with the RBU's agenda. Again, regulation depended on the political construction of the broadcasting landscape, a problem whose regulation was sought at the 1929 uh, conference in Prague. This conference aimed at in integrating numerous Eastern European countries into uh, a new plan, and unlike earlier IBU meetings, this conference involved state uh, administrations, PTT ministries, and the IBU only participated uh, by invitation at this uh, meeting. This established a clear hierarchy between state administrations and uh, the IBU as, one could say, an NGO, while reinforcing its status as an expert body in frequency regulation. Uh, indeed, the Czechoslovakian Telegraph Administration asked the Technical Committee of the IBU to prepare a report which would serve as a technical blueprint for the discussions of the conference. So although some earlier uh, or early IBU warriors like Eckersley saw this new constellation, so the involvement of state authorities at the beginning of the end of the Union's integrity and independence, others saw it or inter interpreted it as a decisive move towards its integration into a governmental system or intergovernmental system of frequency planning and regulation. So um, the Prague plan successfully, successfully really regulated both medium and uh, long waves and included nearly all European stations, 200 of them uh, including uh, those in the uh, Soviet Union uh, which uh, alone served 9 million. Uh, listeners. But again, this success was temporary. The 1930s incredible boom of broadcasting 
continuously challenge the IBU's uh, internal structure and administration. The, union, uh, the, the union's enlargement um, alone between 1929 and 34, uh, they welcomed more than 50 new organizations, um, challenged um, the uh, operations. With the increasing use of shortwaves for radio broadcasting in the early 30s, the regulation of broadcasting frequencies really needed a global solution and not only a European one. So from May 1935 on, the Technical Center started with nightly identification of shortwave radio signals um, and uh, observed and measured some hundreds uh, shortwave stations all over the globe. Um, catapulting the total number of daily frequency measurements up to 700, uh, including yeah, some 500 European stations. So between the Prague plan um, and um, the ne negotiation of its replacement, which was planned for uh, uh, 1933 in Lucerne, um, lies again a phase of yeah, brutal development in radio broadcasting, one could see. You will see it here in, in this graph that both uh, the power of transmitters really catapulted. Uh, more and more stations really transmitted with very strong power and at the same time yeah, the number of stations uh, raised dramatically and this, con okay. uh, this constantly uh, uh, challenged um, really the, uh, the work of the IBU. What's the power scale of, that, of those uh, transmitters? It's a kilowatt. Yeah. Puissance on kilowatt. Yeah. So, so what's, what's the tallest one? 44 kilowatts? Uh, so this one is like, uh, uh, this is like 50, 100 okay. kilowatt, 150, okay. up to yeah, 250. And what we see then in, in the afterwar years, 1950s, is that stations like Radio Luxembourg or Europe number one, they transmit with a power of a thousand kilowatt. And this is constantly uh, causing interferences all over, uh, all over Europe. So I have to, I'm speaking too long, sorry. Um, maybe um, briefly, talk about um, yeah, Radio Luxembourg as uh, the new uh, uh, player in this, uh, in this game. Radio Luxembourg started as a kind of yeah, private initiative by two brothers, the, the Annen uh, brothers, in 1923 already. And from the very uh, beginning they were able to produce a very uh, popular uh, program transmitted in uh, several languages already in the mid-20s, uh, uh, in German, in French, in uh, English, and uh, that caused a lot of yeah, interest in, in the station, especially by French uh, firms who uh, gave a lot of private capital to uh, the station. The problem was that you know, Radio Luxembourg at that time um, was not a member of the International Broadcasting Union and they didn't really care about the frequency uh, plans that were negotiated there, negotiated there. And so they uh, were from the very beginning on uh, characterized as a pirate station by uh, the IBU. And if you call people, uh, uh, if, you, if you tell people now in, in Luxembourg that, yeah, it started as a pirate station, that comes quite uh, as a surprise to them because in 1933 uh, uh, it became officially um, uh, the station which was covered by the state monopoly. Uh, so there was one, uh, there was a, a state monopoly of radio broadcasting in Luxembourg and this frequency was officially then given to Radio Luxembourg uh, and this is a quite unique constellation, so having a private commercial station acting uh, under the under state monopoly. This is quite uh, unique in Europe and that is also why it constantly challenged uh, the regulatory 
uh, ambitions of the International uh, Broadcasting Union. Yeah. No, I don't have the gun because that's the question. <laughs> and another reason for, for these uh, uh, tensions was that it clearly uh, defended <coughs> an, a different vision of what broadcasting should be and what it should be used for. Uh, so it was, um, the ambition was to entertain <coughs> basically people, to transmit uh, so called light entertainment, uh, popular culture. And that was clearly against the much more paternalistic uh, ideology that reigned in most of the uh, public services uh, in Europe, especially the BBC, who served as a kind of role model for, for many European countries, uh, where yeah, the education and information of people was uh, important, and entertainment yeah, uh, less. Although, of course, millions of listeners in Britain turned to Radio Luxembourg to listen to popular music. Um, so this tension also about the, uh, about the cultural mission of radio uh, was very much uh, dis debated in, in the IBU and I think that they called them officially a pirate station was a kind of political act, a power act to keep Radio Lux Luxembourg uh, aside and not to make it part of the, the family of, uh, of European broadcasters, yes. So actually Luxembourg didn't, or Radio Luxembourg didn't participate in the IBU because they weren't allowed to, not because they chose not to participate. Or exactly. am I wrong? Uh, yeah, when, 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 they, when they started they could have joined maybe in the early 20s, but once they, bec uh, they were really popular in the early 30s, the IBU had turned in more or less an association which defended the interests of the public service institutions mm -hmm. and at that time they didn't allow them to, to uh, be part of the game anymore. And so they tried to punish more or less uh, Radio Luxembourg by not giving them uh, a, a specific frequency in the radio uh, spectrum in Europe and to keep them out of, out of, the, out, out of the game, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, on the other side, this shows, as an NGO, IBU had little power to, uh, to fight against uh, what Radio Luxembourg was doing, especially since the po moment that it became an official uh, state monopoly mm -hmm. uh, in the early 30s. Yes. Did Luxembourg just pick a frequency and stick with it, or did they jump around? Or what? They, uh, they at one point just pick uh, picked a, a frequency and uh, this became then as established uh, internationally as, uh, as a frequency. 208 mm -hmm. is still, if you speak to British people, uh, even in the after-war years, in the 1950s, 208, everybody will know, oh, Radio Luxembourg, <laughs> so on the medium wave, uh, although they were not allotted to this frequency by uh, the IBU. So I have to I have to resume. Uh, sorry for speaking too long. So here you see um, the the, the, um, uh, the transmission uh, station of Radio Luxembourg in Jungminster in the early uh, 30s, and you can see that it, they invested a lot in in uh, establishing a very powerful uh, transmitter station, which became one of the strongest in Europe in the interwar uh, years. Um, yeah, here this graph shows that. In the different plans, Geneva, Prague, Lucerne, and Montreux, which never uh, uh, was uh, put into practice because of the outbreak of Second World War, how yeah the number of stations really increased, and also especially how the power uh, exploded, and this again caused uh, a lot of, of of problems and interferences. So it is a continuing kind of soap opera uh, happening, and this was only solved in the post-war years with the coming of FM radio. So only from the moment on that yeah, you avoided to a certain degree the transnational uh, uh, aspect of radio transmissions in, in medium waves or short waves and long waves and you had FM with a range of like 100 kilometers spread then only this European frequency disorder problem could be could be solved uh, in the, in the 1950s. So, 
I try to, 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 to tell this um, story, uh, uh, to, uh, to reflect on the emergence of this regulatory regime um, as a, an example, I think, of a, a very European kind of problem. You didn't have the same problems in the United States because you didn't have that many players, national players, that um, were looking for frequencies, so that it was not that densely populated the either. Uh, and so Europe had to develop a specific kind of yeah, regulatory uh, regime to solve this problem. And I think uh, it is interesting to see how technicians, how experts, engineers, yeah, tried to develop uh, a specific kind of expertise uh, uh, and how they thought that these problems, European problems, political problems, could be solved uh, with so-called, yeah, by applying politics of accuracy, by applying a yeah, kind of rational uh, approach to these problems, and uh, how also specific technologies like the frequency meters can be interpreted in Latour's term as actants, in as non-human actors that yeah, interfered in this uh, in problem, and uh, yeah, how maybe the concept of techno-diplomacy uh, is a good way to think about the emergence of this specific kind of expertise in uh, the interval years. Thank you very much.